when I was in school, I majored in physics and philosophy, but my real interest was in philosophy. And while we did get to read a couple of, well, more than a couple, but a few pieces of uh, philosophy that were from the 20th century, of course, most of it is the history of philosophy, right? You know, going all the way back to, to Plato and even before. And because of that, my, my, some of my knowledge of, of 20th century philosophy isn't as strong as I would like it to be. And we did get to read, as I'll talk about in the review of this book, uh, one essay by someone I'm extremely interested in by the name of Walter Benjamin, the, the German critic and um, just all around sort of fascinating guy. Uh, he was sort of marginally affiliated with a group called the Frankfurt School. And this book that I'm reviewing now is a history of the first generation or so. Uh, in fact, we, we would call them the first generation of the Frankfurt School since, like, a, like I'll mention in the, in the review, there were more than, there, there was actually more than one generation. The book is uh, called The Dialectical Imagination, A History of the Frankfurt School and the Institute of Social Research from 1923 to 1950 by Martin J. Um, in the early 1920s, a formidable array of intellectual talent coalesced into a group in Frankfurt, Germany, that called themselves, uh, and excuse my uh, German pronunciation, the Institut für Sozialforschung, or the Institute for Social Research. They would later become more known, especially in the United States, as, as simply the Frankfurt School. They consisted mostly of assimilated German Jews, and they had a truly impressive body of interests, ranging from everything uh, from socio sociology to sinology. Sinology is the um, academic study of Chinese culture and language. Uh, philosophy, Marxism, musicology, psychology, psychoanalysis, especially Freud. Uh, Max Horkheimer and Theodora Adorno are probably most affiliated with the first generation of the school, but it also included people like uh, Herbert Marcuse, Eric Fromm, Leo Lowenthal, Par uh, Paul Lazarsfeld, and Franz Neumann, many of whom are still read today. But when someone hears the words Frankfurt School today, their influence on Marxism is perhaps what most immediately comes to mind. The members thought that the German Social Democratic Party of the day was spineless and ineffective, but equally thought that the Communist Party of Germany was too hard-lined and too ideological. And because of this, their academic work paved a kind of middle course between the bourgeois politics of the social democrats and the what was becoming incre increasingly sclerotic and obsolescent vulgar Marxism that they perceived in Germany, which of course under uh, Nazi rule was all but to disappear. Martin J. uses this book as kind of an opportunity to write a multi-person biography of the people that I mentioned. Uh, interlarded with the sort of objective, measured perspective that I've come to know Martin J. for. And I say that because I've also read another book of his. Unfortunately, I haven't uploaded it, uh, a review of it up to YouTube yet. But it's called Songs of Experience, Modern, American, and European Variations on a Universal Theme, which is a philosophical history of the idea of experience since about Montaigne, and, and Francis Bacon, uh, 17th century or so. Uh, Montaigne's a little bit earlier than that, I know. But um, mostly through the eyes of philosophers, but he does look at some, some historians. Of course, Montaigne isn't strictly considered a philosopher, more like the father of the essay. But he looks at um, what Montaigne has to say about experience and goes all the way up through the 20th century and looks about and looks at how this concept of experience has changed over time. It's a beautiful book. In, uh, in this book, he addresses the major work that, that these people did, including their analysis of Nazism, their aesthetic theory, and especially Adorno's um, 
really devastating critique of, of mass culture, which he calls uh, in several different contexts. It, there's there's a book by Adorno out called The Culture Industry, which has a lot of those important essays in it. And there's also a phase of their work um, right towards the tail end of the book that concerns their more empirically based work that they did after the end of World War II in the late 40s. Uh, in the last chapter, actually, uh, which would, which uh, I was talking about indirectly at the beginning of the video, there are some important contrib contributions mentioned uh, that Walter Benjamin did, who was a figure, um, like I said, sort of related to the school, but still extraordinarily important in his own right, and maybe even more important for the ways in which he diverged from the Frankfurt School. Uh, not the ways he necessarily agreed with them. Uh, in school, I read Ben Humin's Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, which I'm sure every student in a philosophy of art, art, cap, art class is made to read. Um, and I'm sure that everyone who reads it was as transformed by it as I was. It sort of completely changed the way that I view what it means to have an aesthetic experience and what constitutes an aesthetic experience. And I have several other of Benjamin's work, uh, several other volumes of his work, including one on media criticism that came out not too long ago. And Jay's book has really made me more curious to pick those up. If there's one complaint I could level against the book, it would be that Jay pays almost equal attention to everyone, which sort of makes you lose focus of, of the bigger picture, I think. Um, even even those figures that really uh, relatively few people read these days, for whatever reason, I thought that a history of the Frankfurt School might mean something like a detailed discussion of Horkheimer and Adorno, which are the two figures that really sort of pop to the to the imaginative forefront when you hear Frankfurt School, and and maybe a little you know Herbert Marcuse or Walter Benjamin tossed in for good measure, but. He, he really tells the entire history of the Institute as a body, how it, how it came to be, how it was financially funded. Um, those people in the very first few years who no one knows about now, but who were essential in creating it and maintaining it. And uh, he also talks about some of the more minor figures that were um, closely related to the actual academic work that was going on, but that no one really reads anymore, like Franz Newman or Paul Lazarsfeld. I mean, you know, academic specialists might might read them, but um, most people don't. Uh, if you're looking for a book that gives a more straightforward account of the more uh, major ideas on of critical theory and its continuing interdisciplinary influences, this isn't really the book that you're looking for. Uh, and that is kind of what it seemed to me at the time. Uh, if this is what you're more interested in, I've heard, though I can't confirm because I haven't read them, that the very short introduction series has a group has um, has a a book by uh, Stephen E. Bronner, and uh, Thomas Wheatland came out with a book called The Frankfurt School in Exile, which may be more appropriate for someone who wants to focus in more on the major ideas instead of the, the whole story of the building and the maintaining of the Institute and it's, you know, it being forced out of Germany, which happened um, with the rise of Hitler and them going back to Germany in 1949, right before the book ends. And um, also, of course, this only goes up through through 1950, and there are several people who are known as being second generation and third generation uh, Frankfurt Frankfurt School influenced, or or maybe even Frankfurt School, even though I'm not really sure it's it's an official institution anymore. Um, the the philosopher uh, Jürgen Habermas is often called a second generation. Uh, member of the Frankfurt School, and I believe that uh, the German sociologist and philosopher Axel Honneth is sometimes referred to as either a second or third generation member of the Frankfurt School. But um, it's interesting to note that it doesn't 
end in 1950, at least intellectually end. It, it may have sort of fallen off as a formal uh, group, group, a formally named group, but the ideas lived on. Martin Jay's The Dialectical Imagination, A History of the Frankfurt School and the Institute of Social Research from 1923 to 1950.